Um, well, Henry, great to see you again. Um, thanks so much for, for taking the time out to speak at the Blueprint for, for CEO. Um, yeah, really delighted to, to dive into this and the, the Hyper Growth CEO playbook. Um, we've got 20 minutes to go into it. You, you ready? I'm ready. Thanks for having Let's, me, Alex. Yeah, no, no, always a pleasure. Um, so, Henry, a lot to cover in 20 minutes. Let's get into it. So, I want to start off with hiring culture. Like, what is the advice that you wish someone had given you when it comes to making key hires and building out the right teams and roles? Yeah, I think probably two things. One is everyone is going to tell you something like, it's really important to get your hires right. It's, you know, it's really important to hire the right people. Um, and that's kind of useless advice. Really what they're saying is take your time. It's important to take your time and find the right person. And oftentimes when you're out there searching for the right person, there's already a, you know, there's already a gun to your head and you're like, what do I do? I need this person. This thing is falling apart in my business and I need to go get a VP of marketing, a VP of sales, a VP of customer success. You go interview like three people and you say, oh, that person is better than what I have today. Let me get them in here. That is not the right way to make the decision on a key hire. Take your time, interview a lot of people, find the right fit, be really excited about bringing the person into the organization. And on the be really excited about, about bringing the person into your organization, the other piece of advice that I would give is a lot of times when you're going through this process and you're a first time CEO or first time founder, you end up discounting your gut feeling and you learn to like trust experience. Somebody worked at a big company and did this at another place. So they must be great. And you know, inside they may not be a cultural fit. They said something about, about work-life balance that didn't sit well with you. You can't just run over those things. Like the idea in hiring about trusting your gut and trusting your instinct shouldn't be something you feel bad about. Because that instinct and your gut instinct there is made up of your experience in working in the business every day. You understand your company better than anybody else. And if you have a weird feeling about a hire that you're going to be bringing, bringing in, you're probably right. And so you have two options there. Trust yourself and move on or bring it up to your candidate. And so what I would tell you is in those moments, whatever you're not feeling really great about, Take the opportunity to ask your candidate in another forum, hey, I'm a little bit worried about this thing. How, how would you answer that? How do you feel about that? How should I be looking at that thing? So either give the candidate the, op the opportunity to answer for you and they may just um, reinforce your concerns or they may make you feel really good about what you were concerned about. And you have the option to just move past and trust your, your instinct there. Your instinct is something to be trusted when you're making a hire because it's built up of all of that experience you have in your business. Great advice. And I think it certainly resonates uh, sort of with me and, and hopefully there's some uh, uh, nodding heads in the, in the virtual audience uh, there as, uh, as well. Um, but how, how do you keep your leadership team motivated and nail the division of responsibilities you know, as you scale? Yeah, look, I think the biggest, the biggest thing there is you have to really trust and partner with your leadership team. Um, and that's, again, kind of fluffy. But what that really means is that you're, you know, whether it's your CTO or your chief revenue officer or your COO, they have to feel like you believe that they are the best person for the role that they're doing. That when something goes wrong, that you're going to be a partner to solve it not a person who points fingers, that you're not out there just looking for the next best CRO or the next best CTO, that you really trust that leader and that when something goes wrong, you're not saying, hey, you, I can't believe that you did this thing. If I was just running it or if somebody else was running it, these things wouldn't happen, but that you're really coming to the table and saying, I see this thing went wrong. I see it didn't go the way that I had hoped that it would, it would go or you had hoped you would go. What are we going to do about it? And so making sure your leadership team knows that you trust them and that you're a partner to solve issues in the business with them, that's the most critical thing that you can do. Um, and I think it just starts with making sure they appreciate that you're a problem solver with them, not a finger pointer with them. 
how did you determine where to spend your time in the business throughout the different stages of your growth from 10 million to 100 million? I'm, I'm laughing because I get asked this question all the time, but it's usually I get asked, hey, how do you spend your time in the business today? And I know where that question comes from because I used to ask it all the time. And what I re realized is you just get like a wide assortment of answers. There's no like right way to do this. So when you ask, when I was asking this question, it came from like really a place of insecurity, right? Like, am I spending my time on the right things? And let me just ask this other more successful CEO how he's doing it because I'll just mimic that. Or maybe he's doing it in a way that, that I, I'm not doing it and I'm not doing it right. And the answers are very varied. The way I get a feel for this is I'm really listening to the business. And so if you're paying attention every day inside of your company, you probably have a pretty good feel for where the business needs you. It's usually an area that, you know, it, at any given point in at Zoom Info, something is going wrong somewhere. Um, something's not perfect. It's not living up to my expectations. It's not going as fast as I want it to. And in, for some period of time, I'm going to have to spend more time on that area from an operating perspective than another area of the business. You know, when we made the acquisition of Zoom Info in uh, 2019, I didn't spend almost any time thinking about how I communicated with my staff, how I communicated with the larger, the broader team, how I celebrated wins, how I was transparent about what the company was doing. I didn't have to do that. I had a 500 people in the company. I was basically around a large percentage of them every single day. I didn't have to think about how I communicated with them. But then we made this acquisition. All of a sudden, we had 500 people in Boston, 400 people in Vancouver, Washington, 100 people in Israel, 50 people in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And communication became important. And so what I told you the day before the acquisition around how I spent my time just didn't matter because the day after the business was calling on me to spend my time in a different way. And so you just have to pay attention to your business and really understand what your business is asking of you. That is very different than any other CEO you ask about how they spend their time every day because your business demands different things from you and you should, that's okay. If the most successful CEO that you look up to spends his time very differently than you, that doesn't mean that you're doing it the wrong way. It just means his business is asking for something different than yours is. A great advice there. And uh, I think, as you say, like each business is, is, is very different. I remember when we had you on the podcast, uh, I, I believe that you, you mentioned that you spent about 50% of your time on sales. And then I kind of came back and was thinking, oh, I need to spend 50% of my time right. on sales. <laughs> but actually, I think you say, what, what do you say makes sense? It's where the business kind of needs you uh, uh, at the time. But yeah. people are easily led. Right? I got asked on an earnings call, uh, I don't know, a few quarters ago, what are you hearing from your enterprise customers? And in that moment, I went, am I having enough conversations with my enterprise customers? Because in the previous quarter, I probably had a handful, but not enough where I could tell you like pattern after pattern of what, you, what they were saying. And I sat down with my CFO and I said, look, what is a great CEO doing as it relates to having enterprise customer conversations? Because maybe I'm at a stage where I have to be doing many more of those. And he was like, yeah, you should probably be doing more of those. Okay, great. So I shifted the amount of time I spent and I started talking to more enterprise customers. It's just what the business was asking for in that stage. From, from speaking to customers and enterprise customers uh, to, I guess, like meeting with speaking to investors and reporting to the investors, what advice do you have for, for, for that, for you know, how you meet with them, how you report to them, how much time you spend with them, what you share? Totally. I think the biggest thing that I've learned in the last almost two years or a year and a half since we've been public and the, the year before that, as we talked to investors before we went public, is communication is really important. And what I really mean by that is I never show up to an important meeting having not thought about exactly how I'm going to present whatever it is I'm going to present. I've probably gone through the talk track a few times. I've fixed it. I've tweaked it. I found the right way to segue between thoughts or slides. I thought about what's going to resonate the most with this investor, with this buyer, with this customer. And I worked that talk track 
until I feel really good about it. My first thought about how I would answer a question or how I would present a subject is never the best one. And it's the work that, that I do to like get a draft and rework it and rework it and rework it so that the final product that an investor sees, an analyst sees, or a customer sees is something that's actually been worked over a few times. And in any important communication that you have, you shouldn't just show up and just say the thing that you want to say. You should be thinking about like, how is the other side going to hear it? How are they going to respond to it? Is there a better way for me to present this so that it's, you know, if you're having a tough conversation with one of your direct reports, is there, what's the best way for me to present this? And it turns out if you spend a little bit of time thinking about that, the end result can be endlessly better. Like people say they want feedback. And I've always said, I'm a, I'm a CEO who gives a lot of feedback, but just give it, being someone who like wants to give feedback or being an organization that gives a lot of feedback is not just like vomiting out every single thought you have at every single employee that, you know, you want to give constructive feedback to. It's actually thinking about how you provide that feedback so that your employee, so that your team is able to digest it and then move forward. And if you're not spending time thinking about exactly how you show up in those moments and how you present that feedback, it's just going to be really messy. Following on from that, how do you run productive board meetings uh, and maintain that com uh, communication uh, with the board on an ongoing basis? I, you know, I try to run productive board meetings. Um, that's an evolution. Uh, do I run a better board meeting today than I ran a year ago or a year before that? Yes. Uh, do I run the world's best board meeting? I'm sure the answer to that is no. Um, and I think that what I'm doing more today is after a meeting, I actually have designated a member of my board to go around behind me and get feedback on how the board meeting went from all of the board members and then come back to me and give me that feedback. And one of the things that I learned recently is the board really wants to engage and help. And what they want to be given in moments in the board meeting is opportunities for them to engage, opportunities for them to help with decisions, opportunities for them to give advice. And if the entire board meeting is you know, me talking about results or our team talking about the results of the last quarter, it doesn't create moments for them to engage. And so I've done a lot of work to make sure that when we show up to those board meetings, I'm setting up chunks of, op of time and opportunity for the board members to engage, provide advice and help move the company forward. Um, and I wasn't really doing that historically, but the key change there was I designated a member of our board to go around after every meeting, gather the feedback, get it to me. And then I was able to digest it and go, okay, here are the changes we're going to make in our next board meeting to account for those things. I, I guess kind of it's similar, but slightly different to the, the question we asked about where you sort of spent your time. Uh, here we're sort of looking at how your role as CEO has evolved uh, from 10 million to 100 million. And what are the kind of the, have been the main challenges and lessons that you've learned? Yeah, so 10 million to 100 million, you know, <laughs> you have to get really comfortable with not being the person who's executing everything anymore. Because at 10 million, you're kind of driving most of the business, right? You're like setting up the marketing campaigns and you're hiring the account executives and building the account management plan and setting up Salesforce for your team and figuring out the uh, marketing automation drips. And at 100 million, you're really not executing anymore. You're kind of directing a team of people you really trust to execute for you. And so, but along the way, there are moments where, you know, I felt like I got value out of execution. Like the easiest way to feel like I was making an impact on the business is executing a campaign that resulted in a bunch of leads that we were able to close, getting on a customer call and closing that deal or bringing a renewal in. And all of a sudden, you know, kind of as you move from 10 to 20 to 30, you just weren't able to do that anymore. Um, and so getting comfortable with the fact that you're not going to be, you're not going to gain the value. You're not going to feel the value you're giving the business by actually executing on tasks is just a really important evolution you have to go through. 
Where did you find the best like support groups, networks, coaching, you know, as you grew from the CEO of this 10 million ARR company to uh, the 100 million ARR, you know, at that time? Yeah, look, the, the real answer is I read a lot of like Saster. I read, I went to a lot of webinars like this one and heard from other founders. I read Ben Horowitz's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And I felt like it was like talking to my soul basically <laughs> and said like, okay, this business is not really different than any other business. And I think for me, um, and probably for a lot of founders, not only is this their first time starting a, not only is this their first time founding a business, it might be their first time ever working in one. And so then you start to think that all the things that are weird or uncomfortable and you're busy, you hired a VP of marketing, then you have to fire them three months later, your sales aren't going the right way, your churn is high. You start feeling like all of those things are a function of you, that other good businesses, they don't have those problems. And so just getting an opportunity to read what other people are going through and hear what other CEOs are challenged with just makes you feel a little bit more normal that these are just problems you need to solve. They're not a direct reflection of your inability to build or run a company, but that every company is dealing with those things. And so just the more you get to hear from um, founders and CEOs and read about their struggles and know that the things you're struggling with are not unique to you, they're the things that every business struggles with. I think can give you a lot of peace of mind. Yeah, and I think I think you, you mentioned the hard thing about hard things there, and I think almost it feels like almost every CEO uh, kind of like cites that book as their favorite business book because it it, it just kind of lays out you you know what it really is like, you know how difficult it is, and you you know there's so much uh, there that kind of you know resonates. Uh, it's just you know, got to be that you feel like those issues were unique to you. And then yeah. you read somebody who's so successful, basically tell you, no, I dealt with the same thing. And you're like, oh my goodness, like what a relief, but I still have to go fix those things. We got two and a half minutes for one more question. So I'm going to throw it in there uh, whilst I have you, Henry. So you've spoken before about the importance of hiring a CFO uh, in order to run a metric oriented business. Can you expand why and when to, to hire a CFO? When did you do it? What ARR were you? Yeah, so we did it at about 30 million of ARR. That was probably too long. Um, we probably should have done it at, I don't know, 10 or 15 million of ARR. And really like what happens in that stage of your business is you start having a rhythm for how your business is run. And maybe you just feel it. And so, you know, you come in, you run these campaigns, you set up these calls, you run these account management motions, and then the business kind of runs. But as the business is running, there's a whole bunch of data coming off of it that tells you this is the rhythm of the business. And oh, this thing's not going the way that it should have gone this month. And not having visibility to, into that just makes it so that you're not running as great of a business as you could be. And so my first CFO came in and he said, hey, Henry, I know you feel the rhythm of your business, but let me show you the rhythm of your business. And so that we can put metrics all over the business because the business is creating a bunch of data that we can start leveraging to make better decisions. And so all of a sudden, instead of running into a bad quarter, I knew something was wrong in a quarter because the appointments we were setting, we weren't setting enough appointments. There were a high number of no-shows in the appointments we were setting. We were generating a lot of leads, but they weren't converting to demos. Well, the ones that were converting to demos, I had four account executives who weren't converting them to opportunities or closed business. And all of a sudden, I knew exactly the points in the business to go work on. And without those metrics and without that visibility, you're kind of just going on your gut, which is going to work at some point. But at some point, it becomes too big where you just can't have a handle on all of it or you're just going to make the wrong calls. And so having a CFO that's very business minded, they're not just like doing the ledger. They're architecting the business and the metrics so that you can make good decisions based on them. That's endlessly valuable. Awesome. Well, Henry, uh, I know we've run out of time there and, uh, and you, you've got to jump to another meeting, but really do appreciate you taking time out uh, the busy day uh, uh, to speak at SaaS Blueprint and open the show for us today. So thanks so much, Henry Shuck, CEO of ZoomInfo. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everybody.